the data regarding adjuvant therapy for high-risk RCC. So the background, about 15, 20 percent of patients with RCC present with high-risk local regional disease, which carries a five-year overall survival that's poor, only 50 to 60 percent, so clearly there's a motivation to improve on these numbers. Anti-VEGF TKIs, including sunitinib, have proven survival benefit in metastatic disease, so certainly there's interest in moving them forward. We have two large randomized phase three studies of, well, we have three randomized phase three studies that we'll go over of adjuvant TKI therapy, two of which involve sunitinib and involve uh, over 1,900 patients. So if we think about the metastatic setting for RCC, this is the timeline of approved therapies. As everyone knows, you know, in the 90s, we really didn't have much. Everyone would just get referred for IL-2, and most people didn't benefit from that. Then in 2005, things started to change. Serafinib came on the scene and was quickly supplanted by sunitinib. Of course, serafinib is a drug we use as the comparator on all studies because it's a very poor drug. We have sunitinib, temsirolimus. In 2009, we're accelerating everolimus, bev, pazopinib, and, and you know, ongoing here, axitinib, nivolumab, cabozantinib, and then as you just heard about from Dr. Castle, combination checkpoint inhibitor therapy with ipi and nevo. And perhaps this year we'll get another approval or in the next year for axitinib and pembrolizumab since we've seen that positive data just get reported out. Now the typical, the typical evolution of systemic therapy in medical oncology, of course, is we start in the late stage metastatic setting to prove efficacy, right? You have measurable tumors in place, you can see them shrink, you get a signal as to whether therapy is working or not. And if we prove drugs in the metastatic setting, that's when we start moving them forward into the adjuvant or neoadjuvant setting to try and extend survival in those patients without evidence of disease, right? Those patients who we know are high risk, who have micrometastatic disease, who we want to uh, get rid of that disease before it, can, uh, before it can then recur. And the point of adjuvant therapy, I mean, the true point of it in all other cancers is cure. Right? We are operating on the theory that if we treat disease when it's microscopic, we can cure it even though using those same drugs in the metastatic setting would be non-curative. Right? Because remember, all of these drugs are non-curative for metastatic disease. Almost all solid tumors are non-curative when metastatic. So the idea is get them early. Somehow something is different in that early stage, probably something more than just tumor bulk that we can exploit. So these drugs that I highlight here in yellow are those in which adjuvant studies have been reported out, and we're going to go through all of those studies. And then the ones I highlight in blue are those in which adjuvant studies are ongoing. All right, so sunitinib is the drug that is FDA approved, so we're going to spend the most time talking about that. And for sunitinib, we have two big studies. We have the Assure study, which is ECOG 2805, 1,900 patients. So this was high-risk patients, high-grade RCC, greater than or equal to T1B, post-nephrectomy, could have had some non-clear cell component, and they were randomized one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one on a three-arm study to sunitinib, serafinib, or placebo. You know, this was blinded, but this is a study where we all knew what they were on because the side effect profile of the three arms is so different. I mean, it's, it's not hard to tell what a patient's getting, okay? Then we had the s track study, smaller, 600 patients, looked at a higher risk population than a sure, and this is one-to-one -one sunitinib versus placebo. And the primary endpoint for both of these studies was progression-free survival. Okay, so PFS, and this is a controversial point that we're going to talk about. Slight differences in the assessment, and Assure was investigator assessed, and s track there was central review. So in the Assure study, so this is our three-arm study, this is looking at the disease-free survival, the primary endpoint on the three arms, and as you can see, there is no difference at all here. Okay, so this was reported out in 2016, certainly not a, a positive start for the field as we look at adjuvant therapy. But then s track came out a little bit later and looked slightly different. Here we saw a positive difference looking at sunitinib versus placebo. It met its primary endpoint, the hazard ratio of 0.76 for disease-free survival, statistically significant. And so now we had competing studies, right? We had slight, we, we had, um, we had results that were disagreeing with each other, and then, then we have to do an analysis and figure out what's going on here, because these are not identical studies in terms of the entry criteria. And so if we look at these drugs side by side, uh, look at the two studies side by side, the disease-free survival on the sunitinib ARBs was slightly different. On, the, um, uh, on sunitinib, 6.8 years in s track, 5.8 years in Assure. 
the percentage that were, f that were disease free at five years, fairly close. You see the hazard ratios there, right? Significant in the one study, not significant in the other. And you look at the overall survival and it kind of conforms to our expectations depending upon the study entry there right around 80%. And so of course when we have these competing studies we like to flip over to a meta-analysis and say okay let's put the data together and what do you get? And when you put the two studies together you end up falling with a hazard ratio of 0 0.89. It's close. It crosses one, right? The 95% confidence interval goes from 0.67 to 1.19. This is for the primary endpoint. Toxicity is not negligible. You have grade three, four toxicity on the order of about 60%, not a surprise. This is what we expect to see uh, with sunitinib. And we did have four treatment-related deaths. Okay, not to be dismissed, right? Because remember, this is adjuvant therapy. There is a, a chance that these four patients were cured by surgery and didn't need to go on therapy at all, okay? And without question, with this rate of toxicity, you have inferior quality of life on sunitinib. But because of the difference in the study populations, we've got to think about the fact that only 30% of assured patients would have qualified for S-TRAC. So it raises a legitimate question to say, is S-TRAC the right study because it looked at the right patients? Okay, so nitinib is a good drug in higher risk disease, but in lower risk disease, it's just not the appropriate drug to use. Maybe that's the difference in the results between these two studies. So after we saw that, the Assure study did a, a, re, a subset analysis, unplanned subset analysis, looking at high-risk patients. And here again, you, you don't see any separation between these lines, right, between the three arms. You really can't reproduce that result that we saw in S-TRAC. So what? So what, where do we go with that? Well, in S-TRAC, when we look at these adverse events, I mean, not, not to be dismissed, you know, as we said, there's a very high rate of grade 3 and 4 toxicities, cumulative rate of about 60%. The biggest toxicity is diarrhea. Now, with diarrhea, most of it is grade 2, which could be up to five diarrheal stools a day, okay? And that could be for, you know, six months, 12 months longer, depending upon how long the patient's on adjuvant therapy. Hand-foot syndrome is quite common. Uh, in the grade 3, 4, it's the most common severe toxicity hypertension, fatigue, nausea. I mean, these patients don't feel well. And everybody on a TKI knows it, okay? It's a very rare patient that actually feels okay. On placebo, of course, you know, there's some grade three, four toxicity rate on the order of 20%. And I always point this out because it makes the point that not all toxicities, right, are true toxicities. Sometimes these are just things that happen to patients. Right? So 20% of patients who are receiving a placebo will have a severe toxicity. All right, so that, that's where the data stands. We're going to get to how ODAC treated it, how the FDA treated it. Against this background, we also have the adjuvant pazopanib study. So if you recall, pazopanib and sunitinib for a while were going back and forth in terms of saying which drug would be preferred in the first line setting. We didn't have all of our immunotherapy options. And so pazopanib and sunitinib were compared to each other ultimately in a head-to-head -head study, and the conclusion was that the efficacy is largely similar, but pazopanib is less toxic. And so in practice, for at least a couple of years, pazopanib has won out. Now the data has since matured. We have cabozantinib in this space. We have immunotherapy in this space, so certainly the field has shifted again. But it's a fairly clean comparison or between the two drugs. They act fairly similarly. Uh, the response rates are very similar, but the toxicities are quite different. And so there was interest in this adjuvant study as well. And this was 1,500 patients resected T2 high grade or T3 or higher disease, including N1, and was randomized to placebo versus pazopanib for a year. Now this study started out with pazopanib at the standard dosing, 800 milligrams, and that proved to be too toxic. 400 patients in, the patient dropout rate was excessive, and so they actually had to amend the study to start patients at the 600 milligram pazopanib dose. And truly the toxicity of this drug was not any higher than what had been seen in the metastatic studies, but it makes the point right, that it's much harder for patients to stay on drugs in the adjuvant setting when they may or may not need the drugs at all. Okay, I mean the, the mentality is different when you have metastatic disease and you know this is what you have to go through in order to extend your life versus going on a drug because maybe it'll help because maybe you've got 
uh, residual disease, but of course maybe you don't. So when they amended the study, the primary endpoint analysis was changed to look only at the 600 milligram pisoponib population. And the primary analysis was performed after there was 350 events. And the secondary endpoint looking at the DFS and the 800 milligram population. And here's what you get looking at the 600 milligram population, right? You see some separation of the curves here between placebo uh, and pisoponib. You know, but the hazard ratio, 0.693, okay, long, you know, P-score, 0.02, there's something there. Um, uh, I'm sorry, this is the 800 milligram, but on the, on the 600 milligram over here, it's just not that significant. Unfortunately, the significance is, you know, largely lost. At the end of the day, the hazard ratio is 0 0.86, it crossed one, the P-score was 0.16. So we fall short of the primary uh, endpoint of the study. And here's the overall survival curves, right? I mean, they lie right on top of another. I'm gonna accelerate a little bit here, but looking at the adverse events, there's no great surprises here. This is what we would expect from experience uh, amongst patients on pisoponib. So ultimately, the conclusion of this study is that adjuvant pisoponib at full dose is not tolerated. And unfortunately, there's no disease-free survival, overall, overall survival benefit with pisoponib at the lower dose that patients were able to tolerate. So we've gone through three studies, you know, two looking at sunitinib, one looking at pisoponib. We have one positive study. We have the other two that are negative. And against that setting, the, the interest turns to, you know, the other drugs, right? We have everolimus. This is an mTOR inhibitor. Perhaps mechanism is the key here. So we've never had an adjuvant study of a VEGF-directed therapy, you know, bevacizumab, uh, TKIs, anything, in any disease that's worked. And we've tried this in breast cancer and lung cancer, I mean, all over the place, but there's not a single positive adjuvant study using, a, um, using an anti-VEGF agent. I mean, why is that, right? And this is the issue I raised last year. It's entirely theoretical, and it's an argument, you know, we've had in tumor board for years. Right? If you're affecting blood vessel growth, is that enough to kill micrometastatic disease? Because, of course, micrometastatic disease doesn't have its own blood supply. Right? It's too small for that. It just exists in that milieu of, of the kind of freely circulating um, nutrients and whatnot. So is that a legitimate target? Unfortunately, we've done this, you know, in colon and breast and lung. Like I say, we're not seeing those results. So perhaps you go to a different mechanism. So S931 is ongoing. This is Everolimus. Enrollment has completed. We're awaiting those results. And the immunotherapy studies are ongoing. Pembrolizumab, nivolumab, atezolizumab, or ipinevo combination. Now, in this setting, at least, we have positive studies of adjuvant immunotherapy that are positive in melanoma. So maybe, maybe this is the right way to go, right? Because, of course, renal and melanoma tracked together for so many years with IL-2. All right. So what do we do with sunitinib? So this was a conversation last year, you know, ODAC was just on the way um, as, I, as I presented, um, or I presented right after ODAC before the FDA. And on September 19th, ODAC had a vote that went six to six, the 12 member panel split on whether to recommend sunitinib as adjuvant therapy for high risk RCC. The updated hazard ratio for the overall survival was 0 0.92 at the time. And the question, the, the big, biggest part of the debate is what is the endpoint that matters? Is it overall survival or is it progression-free survival? And the reason we sometimes use PFS is in a variety of situations, we have done the analysis, the, the kind of rigorous statistical analysis that demonstrated that PFS acts as a surrogate for overall survival. Colon cancer is probably the most famous example of that. You know, you have multiple studies now with many thousands of patients, you know, approaching 10,000 patients, and they can do that analysis and show that the PFS is an adequate uh, surrogate for OS with a very tight correlation. That is shown in some settings, it is not proven true in others, and it's actually never proven true in renal cancer. All right, so there are a lot of us that looked at this and said, look, you can't use PFS as your surrogate here, OS is the, is the appropriate endpoint, and that's why the vote split six to six really around this central issue. 
But regardless, you know, ultimately with the split, you know, ODAC doesn't make the final recommend, or ODAC issues a recommendation, FDA makes the final decision, and FDA did approve sunitinib as adjuvant therapy for high-risk RCC. So it's available. Our patients can get it now. Um, you know, firming grade, gra greater than or equal to two, ECOG um, better than one or better. But like I say, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm tilted in this. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not hiding that fact. You know, I would argue that it's not how you start the race, it's how you end that matters. You know, patients don't really care what their disease-free survival is. What they really care about is how long they're going to live. So the fact that surrogacy is not proven certainly matters. You know, and I make the point, if you're going to live the exact same amount of time, then if I can give you the first two years of that without toxicity, that's a win. Giving you a slight delay in progression in exchange for toxicity doesn't make sense. And if you can't tell, we're not doing a lot of this uh, in, in the Mayo practice. So if you can get the same outcome but start therapy years later, why wouldn't you, right? And then I asked this question, and we still don't really have a good answer. When does a MET become a MET? You know, disease-free survival is defined by the appearance of a new lesion meeting size criteria. You know, it's entirely possible that VEGF therapy decreases the size of your small metastases, make them, makes them less visible, right? RCC is typically highly vascular, right? You see this, this nice bright MET on your, um, on your chest CT with IV contrast. So if you have, you know, 500 million tumor cells that, that are highly vascular and so you have, you know, 30% cellularity and you have a nice plump one centimeter tumor that you can identify versus if you have 500 million cancer cells with no vascularity and it's two and a half, three millimeters and you miss it on your scan, does that matter? Is that all we're doing with disease-free survival? Just saying, look, we identified it early because it's fatter, right? I mean, so we've got, I don't know, Kobe beef as opposed to a, uh, you know, as opposed to a black Angus, but, uh, you know, a cow's a cow, as far as I'm concerned. My wife comes from a ranching family. I probably shouldn't say that. Um, okay. So d disease free survival may well be a radiographic artifact without clinical significance. At least it's not significant in terms of telling you how long the patient's going to live. All right. So sunitinib is the only approved agent for use as adjuvant therapy in high-risk RCC. Perhaps we're going to get other agents, but as of right now, this is the only agent. Truth is, uptake among oncologists appears to be fairly low, and mostly because of the reasons I've outlined. I mean, we all know what these drugs do to patients, and, and they're just not easy. At the moment, there's no demonstrable overall survival benefit, and that's why, let's say, there's equipoise on the issue. But as I say, I'd say quality of life matters and toxicity is significant. I'd say the goal is to cure, right? With adjuvant therapy, the goal is to cure. It is not to delay. The only good cancer cell is a dead one, right? We want to kill these cells. But again, if VEGF is your target, really what you're targeting is more the tumor vasculature, not the cancer cell itself. Frankly, and this has been my bias for several years now, I don't think VEGF therapy makes sense in an adjuvant setting. I think we need research into better adjuvant therapies. And this is one of the reasons that we go away from saying, let's put patients on sunitinib. I think it's far better to continue putting patients on trials because the answer we have is, is simply not good enough. And the question becomes, do you have to randomize patients to sunitinib as your comparator? Can you randomize them to placebo? And I would say until you have overall survival benefit, you really can continue to randomize to placebo. Thanks very much.